Jen. In a world of war, famine, and disease, where children grow up as orphans, where families go hungry, and entire regions face destruction by illness, God, we call upon you to come. In a world where so many have lost hope, we call upon you, Lord of hope, to come. In this season of Advent, we wait for the coming of hope into our world. We await the birth of the Christ child, the coming of God into our lives in a new way. Come, Messiah, come and save us. Dear God, we pray for the hope that is in Christ to come into our lives in a new way. May we become the hope that is alive in our world. Amen. Our carol of praise, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, hymn number 79. Will you stand as we sing together?
Welcome. Welcome to the first Sunday of Advent. In the Christian church calendar, today is New Year's Day. We left off last week with a celebration of Christ the King over all creation. Today, rather than reshelving the book, putting it away, we flip back to the front and we start again as the church has done for nearly 2,000 years. We start again by telling God's great story from the beginning, from the voice crying out in the wilderness. As an Advent theme this year, Beth and I have chosen the gift of presence. Now, yes, that's a bad pun. You expect that from me by now. Yeah, yeah, it's true, but it's a good theme nonetheless. The gift of presence. Each week, as we make our pilgrimage toward that manger in Bethlehem, we'll see different faces. Today, it's John the Baptist's face and his clothes and his beard with honey stuck in it and the way he must have smelled as he cried out in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, he thunders Isaiah's words. That's where we are today with John the Baptist, the gift of the presence of God. A few logistics for this Advent season. First, we won't be making any announcements from the pulpit this season. Don't fear, though, there's a newsletter calendar, there's a bulletin calendar, there's Facebook, and there's the phone fight system. You will know what's going on. But for this season, we're going to lean in around this wreath like we did today, every Sunday, and focus on the growing light of Christ as we move toward Christmas. Second, I want you to notice the Advent Carol. That's the piece that's stuck into your bulletin that looks like it's handwritten because it is handwritten. We didn't do that because we couldn't find sheet music. We did that because Beth and John Parker took some music from the cantata and arranged this hymn for us this Advent season. This hymn about God's presence, it is Beth and John's gift to you as you worship this December. And the last note, or the next to last, is the doxology. It looks the same, praise God from whom, it looks the same, but it's not the same. It's a little bit different tune. You'll catch on, it's got a little more lift, a little more light for Advent. Again, welcome. Welcome to the worship of God this first Sunday of Advent. Peter gives directions for living in the meantime. A reading from the book of 2 Peter. Don't let it escape your notice, dear friends, that with the Lord a single day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a single day. The Lord isn't slow to keep his promise, as some think of slowness, but he is patient toward you, not wanting anyone to perish, but all to change their hearts and lives. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, the heavens will pass away with a dreadful noise. The elements will be consumed by fire, and the earth and all the works done on it will be exposed." Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be? You must live holy, godless, or godly lives, waiting for and hastening the coming of God. 
Because of that day, the heavens will be destroyed by fire, and the elements will melt away in the flames. But according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness are at home. Therefore, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found by him in peace pure and faultless. Consider the patience of our Lord to be salvation, just as our dear friend and brother Paul wrote to you, according to the wisdom given to him. Here ends the first lesson. loving God. We gather again on this Sunday like we do most Sundays, but today is different. Today is a new year. Today is a new season. We gather today with an anticipation, an expectation, a hope, and a prayer that when we reach all the way to December 25th, we will indeed find hope born in a manger all over again. God, we pray today as we gather in for worship that you will carry for us our cares and concerns for just a little while, that we might lean in on this Sunday of hope and hear a word from you. God, if we're to hear you in our life, in the day-to-day grind, we must be a prayerful people. And the best prayer that we know, the one that we rehearse and practice and pray every Sunday, is the one that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. We, his disciples, Join our voices now in one bold voice and pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you take out your Advent carol insert and let's sing together.
Mark begins the story of the life of Jesus with a prophet crying out in the wilderness. A reading from the Gospel of Mark. The beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ, God's Son, happened just as it was written in the prophecy of Isaiah. Look, I am sending my messenger before you. He will prepare your way. A voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the Baptist was in the wilderness calling for people to be baptized to show they were changing their lives and their hearts and wanted God to forgive their sins. Everyone in Judea and all the people of Jerusalem went out to the Jordan River and were being baptized by John as they confessed their sins. John wore clothes made of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. He announced, one stronger than I is coming after me. I am not even worthy to bend over and loosen the strap of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Here ends the gospel lesson. In our hymn of stewardship, number 112, Child in the Manger, please stand. We need some offering takers. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know how I always get the, <laughs> the weird stuff. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we've arrived at hope. We still have to travel through peace and joy to get to love. Love in the form of a baby in a manger. In response to that love, help us to be good stewards. Bless these tithes and offerings these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
fortunate here at First Baptist Church. Not every small church in a small town in the country has a recorder and a drum on Sunday morning. Not every church has a handbell choir. Not every church has a group of people who will just jump in and take up the offering even if you didn't get a letter. <laughs> We're pretty fortunate around here. And I'm glad to be here on this first Sunday of Advent. And I can't quite help doing it. i got to do it just for this minute. I'm also glad that my family is here on this first Sunday of Advent. I promise not to indulge too much, but... <laughs> anyway, anyway, John the Baptist the gift of presence. Here's the question I want to start with. Can you imagine being one of John the Baptist's followers in this moment narrated in Mark's gospel? You might be a craftsperson or a fisherman, maybe a tax collector. You were going about your business one day when a wild-looking man came by preaching a message that to your ears sounded like good news. Yeah, he's dressed a little, okay, a lot, weird. He looks like one of those prophets of old. You know, you get the history book off the shelf and you're looking back, you know, past Napoleon, past uh, Alexander the Great. Oh, there they are. Yeah, they look like the cavemen. And he looks like one of those. Nobody wears camel skin anymore, by the way. That is so out of vogue. <laughs> Nobody eats locusts anymore. They just crunch so loudly, even if you have your mouth closed. So distasteful. And for goodness sake, if you're going to eat wild honey, clean it out of your beard when you get done. You know... Uh, John the Baptist is kind of weird. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. You probably have. You've heard many sermons on this passage. John the Baptist is a little weird. Nobody does these things anymore. But hey, two Sabbaths ago in the temple, the priest's sermon was on 1 Samuel 16. The story of Samuel anointing Jesse's son, King David, over Israel. You were there. You heard it. David, who was a smaller frame youngest son. David, who couldn't even wear Saul's armor. David, who was just a shepherd kid. And you remember, you remember in that sermon, the punchline, God doesn't look at things the way humans do. God looks into the heart. You remember that. You were there, and so you decide this is one of those moments. Here's this guy walking by. He looks funny. He sounds funny. He kind of smells funny. 
He's walking by, but he seems to be saying good things. He's straight out of 500 B.C. And you know, this isn't 500 B.C. anymore. But God looks at the heart of things. So maybe, just maybe, you will too. And you decide to follow him. You think that perhaps he is heading to the cities somewhere, the, the important places, the, the centers of government and power. You think he's headed there, and the thought of that excites you because he's going to bring truth there. But the weeks drag on. The weeks drag on, and you're still hugging the lip of the Sea of Galilee in the middle of the desert. The weeks drag on and you're starting to go, you know, I don't know about this. If this guy is really all that he's cracked up to be, then why are we still out here on these side roads? Maybe I should have stayed back there with my boat. Maybe I should have stayed in my tax booth back there. Then, he does what he does in this passage. Then, after all that, John says in the words of Isaiah, Look, I am sending my messenger before you. He will prepare your way. A voice shouting in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Clever, you think to yourself, and faithful too. Maybe he doesn't just look like one of those prophets of old. He just evoked maybe maybe he is one of them maybe this guy is elijah come back maybe maybe moses even now it's really exciting surely something is coming at last god's true servant has arrived and i you get to be right there in the fold of the action. One stronger than I am is coming one stronger than I am is coming after me. I'm not even worthy to bend over and loosen the strap of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This man says, Talk about letting the air out of the sails, huh? Talk about a letdown, huh? One stronger, later. Not me, him. Well, I thought I was following the guy. I thought I was going to be there. I thought I was in. We all want to follow the right one, don't we? We all want to be a member of the right church, to work for the right company with the best benefits package. We all want to invest the right portfolio, attend the right school, go to the right hospital. We all want the best, the best for ourselves and our loved ones. I can't imagine that human nature has changed that much since the days of John the Baptist. So I think it's safe to say that John the Baptist's disciples were looking for the best too. The best, the brightest, the most successful. But John the Baptist is having none of it. And neither does the gospel according to Mark. Mark begins his gospel like the opening of a Star Wars movie. Yeah, that's right. You know how the words scroll up the screen? Yeah, that's how this begins. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, God's Son, happened just as it was written about in the prophecy of Isaiah. Look, I am sending my messenger before you. He will prepare your way. You see it scrolling, right? Yellow on a on black background, scrolling up. Have, have you? Do I need to rewind? Okay, all right. He will prepare uh, your way. 
uh, a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Once the words leave the screen, the camera pans down, you know what I'm talking about, and there's John the Baptist. There's John the Baptist. John the Baptist, wearing camel skin clothes, crunching on locusts with food stuck in his beard. Mark could have begun his gospel like John did. John, the other gospel writer, John. Mark could have started his gospel in the cosmos. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Everything came into being through the Word, and without the Word, nothing came into being. Now that's a beginning. That's how you start a gospel. But Mark, Mark didn't start that way. Mark started with a story that scrolls off the screen before the real action even begins. And John, John stands in that moment and says, not me, not me, but the other one, the one coming after me. Can you imagine being John's disciple in this moment, narrated by Mark? This month, this Advent, worship at First Baptist Church will be held by the theme, The Gift of Presence. Presence because each week we will listen and look at a different voice. Presence because this season the church calendar is all about incarnation. That's when Jesus comes and dwells among us. Presence because, yeah, as Andrea so rudely pointed out, uh, I'm a Baptist preacher and a geek and I like a bad pun just like the rest of you. And presence because your presence, yours, is so vital in this space, this time of year, as we pilgrimage toward Christmas. We'll visit with John. We'll visit with Mary and Gabriel, shepherds and magi, Simeon and Anna. Advent doesn't just happen on its own. It happens here in this presence, among and within each of you. When I chose this theme, John and Beth responded by arranging that Advent carol out of the cantata music. If you didn't get it today, don't worry, we're going to sing it all month long. And we'll get it, because it's good, and it talks of presence. As we lean into this theme, I find myself grateful that John the Baptist is the leadoff hitter. In his camel hair clothes, wild woolly hair, that story began before and will go on after, says John the Baptist. John the Baptist stands here a vestige of the past, somebody from an era long gone, reminding us that this story is bigger than we are. This story is older than we are. And this story will outlive us. This story is God's great story. And that's what we're up to in Advent. Part of the job of a preacher is to listen to other preachers, and this week I heard the words of a preacher I admire, uh, Reverend Lillian Daniel, uh, is a pastor in Iowa somewhere, and she says simply, thank God for freaks like John who were called not to manage their image, but to tell the truth. Thank God for freaks like John who were called not to manage their image, but to tell 
the truth. Yes, and thank God for the reminder that we are so much like him. We are but preparers. We are not the crescendo of the music. We are not the, uh, the protagonist of the story. We are like John, waiting, watching, preparing. The world already has a savior. It doesn't need you to be that. That's what John is saying. In Advent, it's our job to do what John did. Put on a little absurdity. Can we do that? A lot of responsible people in this room, myself included, Hard to put on absurdity when you're so responsible. Can we put it on and wait and watch for God to show up? And when God shows up, can we then point and say, there, there, there's God in this Advent season? Can we do that? Because that's what John the Baptist is doing. How about a starter list? How about worship at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning at First Baptist Church? There, there God is. How about a live nativity float that exceeded everybody's uh, imagination this year. There. There's God. How about a party at the Middlesboro Boys Group Home Thursday night? There's God right there. How about donations of clothing to the Middlesboro Elementary School? How about the hanging of the green that happened here while you were away? there. God's there too. How about Christmas food baskets? You know, some people join this church because we do that. How about Thanksgiving dinners? It was hot that night. Man, was it hot because the room was so full. There's God right there. How about Rojo? I tell, somebody tell David Mike I called his name aloud. Uh, he plans the whole thing after Tuck. How about Rojo? Right there. Christmas caroling, CCM toy drives. You know, I often say, I've said this several times, you don't always laugh, but I say, you know, you all go nuts during Advent. I feel compelled to remind you of that because no other church that I've ever been at does what you do in Advent. It's kind of like you think this is the last one they'll ever be every year. You go nuts, but I love you for it, and there God is too. Do you need one more for your list? Just one more? How about the offerings that were made to the FBC Christmas Advent devotional this year? How about those? This morning, before I came here, I read Charles Jones' uh, devotion. I told Charles I was going to call his name out and to mute Rocky Top on his phone. Uh, <laughs> Um, I read Charles Jones' offering for today, the first Sunday of Advent. Beyond the sermon title, Charlie could not have known what I was going to preach on today, but the comical words with which he opened his devotional are just right for the ending of this sermon. Charlie writes, as I was growing up, it was not unusual for people to recognize how much I take after my dad. They would say, there goes little Alan. 
As I got older, I would return by saying, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. <laughs> I laughed for a good 30 seconds over that. I just want you to know. But there, there God is also. Live like John the Baptist this season. Live in such a way that if somebody says, what's up with you? Why are you so joyful? What is going on? You can say, if you've seen me, you have seen the one that comes after me too. There is God. Amen. In just a few moments we'll sing. In just a few moments we'll go out from this place and we won't come back until Wednesday night for the family Advent service. Maybe you need something in this moment of opportunity. If you do, ponder it, pray about it. Come talk to me if you need to as we stand and sing. You know, the lectionary has at least four scripture passages every week of the year. We don't use four, but in Advent, because the lectionary gives us Paul's greatest hits, we're going to close out the service with one of Paul's epistles each Sunday. If you would, grab your order of worship. You only have to read the last line and receive this benediction that is 2,000 years old. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in Him, in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end, 
so that you may be blameless on the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Go in peace.